What's going on guys? We are over here in Ohio. Got my grandfather here. We're gonna go look at some tractors today. First stop is going to be Rule King. I don't think he's ever even heard of the Rule King tractors, so we're gonna stop by and let him get a glance at those. We might go look at some others. We might go look at some green and some orange tractors as well. Reagan, when you saw the Rule King tractors, what did you think of them when you saw them in person? Nice. I mean, I thought I think they look like they're well put together. I mean, I've tried to compare them the best that I can, apples to apples, trying to compare them to similar models in John Deere and Kubota, like horsepower wise, PTO power wise, um, and just, you know, frame and chassis size, like trying to see an actual comparison. I don't know, maybe it's just me blinded by how stupid good the price is, but they look they look like a great machine for what you pay. I don't know, we're gonna go take a glance, like showing him. He was hoping for some Alice Chalmers tractors, but <laughs> I, you know it's it's kind of kind of hard to come by an Alice Chalmers tractor a lot anymore. You still have an Alice Chalmers tractor? Yeah, an old WD forty five, about yeah. a nineteen fifty to fifty four, somewhere around that area. You had a couple of them at one point, didn't you? Yes, old one. Which I wish I had it back. I had the white front end on it. Yeah. You put those tractors through the ringer the one time I was over there. You were clearing some ground back behind the pond and you were popping wheelies with that back blade on it and stuff, trying to clear some clear little dirt. I was like, oh my goodness. I had that on video actually. Just clearing off all that greenery so we can get up closer to those trees, I guess. But. He's popping wheelies in that tractor. I never did like those tractors with the two wheels up front, real close together. My dad had one and they just, they'll throw you up in the air like nothing. And going uphill, you're just asking for problems. <laughs> this is not the way to do it. <laughs> You're probably right about that. The tractor kept coming up off the ground. It was it was funny. But uh, anyways, we're on our way down here. We're going to see if we can't find some tractors and take a look. So we haven't gotten out to look yet, but he's going to get out here and take a gander and let you know what he thinks about them. What do you think about the Royal King tractors? First impression, you haven't driven one, but first impressions. Not sold on the seating arrangement. To swivel the seat around. For the backhoe operation. They're cool, but they're, you know, the smaller ones is what we're talking about. The smaller ones, I just, maybe they just don't have the room to do it. That was the only thing that he was like, well, so do you stand operate your rear back on those small tractors or? So this is what he was talking about. He's talking about the backhoe on these uh, smaller ones, the RK, I think it's RK24. He's just wondering how you operate the backhoe and does the seat flip down? Does it swivel around? How does that work? So now we're looking at some Kubotas. Comparing the two. And then we're going to be making a stop over to see some John Deere tractors. Well, we just left the Kubota dealership, looked around, saw the tractors. Hey, Reagan. Looked at the, the bigger ones over there. Looked at the little BX right here. They're about the same as your first ones we looked at, aren't yeah. they? I mean, like layout wise, he was looking at this little one here and he's like, I don't notice at least that not at a first glance not a lot of not a lot of obvious differences other than the pedal placement was different i mean but other than that i mean it was i mean it, it appears similar price, um, compared to the i didn't look at the price i didn't see there's no pricing on these ones that i could find the rk ones they had like a plaque out there and you could see the pricing and yeah. horsepower and loader capacity and brake force power and all that other stuff you could see all of that stuff on there brochure they had out there. I know that they're quite a bit more expensive though. I do know that. I want to guess that one would probably be over 15,000. Maybe there's just a lot more differences I don't see. There's a little John Deere. I was looking for something with a backhoe hooked onto it. Yeah. You know what? They've got one out front. Let's go check that one out.
Well, we just checked out the John Deere's. Last one of the day. What did you think of the John Deere's? Did you like their setup a little better or no? Uh, I like the color. <laughs> <laughs> and that's saying a lot because it's not orange. Usually he's a fan of the Alice Well, Chalmers. orange would be first place, but... <laughs> I don't know if the Kubota and the and not the Mahander, the Kubota and the Roll King tractors offer this, but the Kubota and the uh, Roll King tractors that we looked at, they didn't have a seat for the backhoe operation setting. The John Deere ones, all the ones that we saw with a backhoe on it, had a flip up seat. So you would just flip the front seat forward onto the wheel, and then the back seat would just flip down, and then you could sit to operate your backhoe. But I don't know, but. That seemed the biggest difference between the two, but yeah, were they all diesel tractors? All diesel, yeah. Yep. Same size. Same diesel. size. Yep. All very, very similar. Then a couple horsepower of each other. Well, guys, that was fun. I liked spending time with my grandpa. I always enjoy when I get the chance to do that. I haven't been able to do that as much in the last two years. When you get married, things just you know you get you get a little bit busier. Um, you've got more things, more responsibilities, and so I don't just have the freedom to just drop what I'm doing and you know uh, take a trip to hang out with the grandparents for three, four, five days at a time like I used to when I had nothing going on. I didn't have my own place. I didn't have, you know, just not as many things going on, you know. I wouldn't trade the life that I have now for anything. But anyways, guys, we're actually at Reagan and I's Ohio property again. I'm going to be doing a little bit more uh, property work today, of course. I've got some hinge cutting I've got to finish up along the back property line, but then I wanted to show you guys something else that I'm going to be working on that's not just a hinge cutting for like a property barrier, but I'm actually going to be creating a feeding slash travel corridor, and it does you know, require some hinge cutting, but the purpose of this is a totally different purpose. This is more specifically to create a funnel for these deer to feed on and travel along to hopefully get you some closer shots. It's gonna provide some food for the deer, uh, more than just the hinge cuts themselves. We're gonna be putting in some food plots and stuff, but I'd like to get some trees dropped on the left and right of a couple of the paths back through the woods where we're gonna be putting in food. That way we have ample sunlight above and also those hinge cuts along the sides of these little feeding strips is what I'm gonna call them, is gonna actually increase the ability for a mature buck to want to feed in these areas because there's going to be more cover on side to side and it's not going to feel like this vast open space like a giant crop field where they don't usually want to go out there a mature deer that knows better doesn't usually want to go out there until after dark because of human pressure the mature deers experience human pressure typically in most cases for a few years now and they understand they encounter humans mostly in the daylight therefore they fear feeding in wide open spaces in the daylight so uh, this is going to be one of those things where deer feed five times in a 24 hour period so what i want to try to do is create a feeding funnel or feeding trail that these deer are very comfortable feeding with maybe it's not their destination food source but getting them up on their feet a little bit closer to daylight where they have the ability to feed on their way to where they're going therefore giving me or my wife a shot at a mature deer on our property uh, and putting odds in our favor a little bit more so that's something we didn't have this past year was you know any kind of food plots or anything back in the property it was just all woody browse the only open fields or food feeding areas were just you know the crop fields that were harvested so we're gonna see if we can make some changes hopefully you guys enjoy this and uh, we're gonna get back there and get to work. So here's the area I stopped on last time in the last video. Um, you can see this is where I stopped. I'm gonna show you something here, but this is all I've gotta do is from here over to right here. And there's a steep bank that goes over here and uh, goes down to this currently completely flooded river. This river's already really big, but uh, now it's just completely flooded on top of that. So uh, you can see one of my property signs right there on the back of that tree there. Property stakes themselves are right here. You can see that stake right here. There's one here and there's one there. Then there's an old beat down fence over here, but the most recent stakes and paint on that stake is... Um, what we go off of. You can see the property line, the signs going all the way down there. A bunch of geese taking off. So anyways, what we're gonna do here is drop more trees, pretty much everything 
from where I stopped all these trees here over to here. And something I got asked the other day, they said, why would you hinge cut if it means you're killing the good trees? A perfectly good tree, why would you do that? Like a hickory, a small oak, a hard maple, whatever. You know, people ask me, why would you do that? And to be honest, I love the trees and every time you hinge cut a tree, there's a little bit of this like remorse of like, ah oh, man, shoot, like this is a 20 year old or this is a 15 year old or a 10 year old, you know, young tree that like, ugh, it's a nice straight tree. Like maybe it could have been a big quality tree that could have brought you several hundred dollars 20, 30 years from now. And that's my point that I want to make here. I'm not in the business of Oh, I bought this ground for 45,000 bucks and oh, I've got to hang on to all these trees so that, you know, when I'm 45 years old, I have a nice timber crop to take out of here. Like, I really don't care. Like, I'm not in the business of timber. I'm in the business of doing truck giveaways and selling merch and doing YouTube and, you know, investing my money in assets that, you know, grow way faster than timber on your property, especially on a small property, it's 26 acres. So it's like, that's not how I make my living. And so I'm not going to sacrifice the quality of my hunting experience here with my wife and my son over the next 15 years because I'm worried about making a few thousand bucks on timber with the one line of trees I'm hinge cutting down the property line. like. You guys have to keep in mind, the whole rest of the property is doing, doing its own thing. There's just a few small areas where I do this. It's not every single tree gets hinge cut. Like there's a lot of trees here that we're never gonna touch and they're just gonna have time to mature and grow and whatever. And if anything, the trees that are along the sides of these hinge cut rows are probably gonna get more nutrients, more sunlight, and be able to grow nicer and straighter and all that other good stuff. So, you know, everybody has their own preference. I know people that are like, oh, I'll never hinge cut because, you know, two generations from now, they could have a beautiful, huge hardwoods forest that they could harvest. I'm thinking, I really don't care what this place looks like two generations from now. Like, it really does not matter to me. I would rather invest my money and have real assets to give my kids, not, you know, a tree harvest that they can harvest once and then they're gonna have to sit on it until their kids or their kids' kids can get another harvest out of it. Like. Everybody has their own mindset. That's to me that that's not a big concern of mine I'd rather focus on other things in the meantime have an awesome property That's high quality with tons of memories to create with my kids with high quality hunting and all that other stuff Because they're gonna remember that stuff more than dad didn't harvest those trees so that I could have one harvest out of it You know 50 years from now. Let's show you this stuff that the deer tore up over here So this is where I stopped and these deer I'm telling you when I did this uh, it was probably four or five days ago now when I actually filmed that video. There was like, there were some, there was like a couple trails that cut through along here, but there wasn't anything crazy. And now when you look over here, there's fresh droppings everywhere, absolutely everywhere. And there's deer tracks all over, again, under all of this stuff. And the deer just tore it up. I mean, they tore it up in here. I mean, it is just crazy how much they just tore up in here. I mean, all the tracks in here, all the buds chewed off again. And you can look at look at some of these little little buds that were started on here. They're just chewed off again. I mean, look at that. Yeah, so just chewed up. I mean, look at all the tracks in here. I mean, it's just crazy. These were not here. And I did this a few days ago. And they're all over up under all this stuff. I don't see any beds under it though, which is good. I mean, a deer could bed under here in some of these spots just fine or along the edge of it, no problem. But my goal is not to make this bedding. I'm just trying to make a wall. I mean, you can see how high this is. I mean, it's probably nine foot tall here, the brush. For a little for a little spurt here little distance but i mean yeah the deer just really they're just tearing it up you can see all the tracks and all the mess under here and just tracks everywhere they're cleaning up the buds as soon as these trees hit the floor i'm telling you as soon as those trees come down and hit the forest floor they look at it as like you dumping a bag of corn except it's more natural to their environment so they just go crazy over it and some people think that you know deer are exactly like people you know like oh well what would they rather have a bag of corn or have to go get it out of the cornfield 
uh, go get it out of the cornfield. You know what I mean? They'd rather have a low pressured feeding crop area that's not being hunted 24 seven. They'd rather go feed in the field so they can spread out from the other deer and keep their distance than be on a corn pile where there's 20 deer trying to feed on a hundred pound pile of corn and they're constantly fighting over it. They're rearing up and trying to hoof the crap out of each other because there's too many of them in one spot. I mean, deer are not exactly like people. So you just have to keep that in mind. Um, you might think, oh, well, I'd rather have a buffet than have to go out and hunt my food down. But it's like deer are not the same as people. Clearly, uh, there's, there's a difference. So just keep that in mind. Deer like what's natural to them and what's natural to them in their environment more than you realize. So, um, if you can give them more of what they already like day to day, perfect. So we're gonna get to hinge cutting the rest of this here and get over to that other spot and create that little feeding trail that I was talking about earlier. Well, unfortunately, I have to leave. My wife forgot some stuff that she needs in her truck that I am driving. So I'm gonna have to leave. I'm about 45 minutes from where she's at and she needs her stuff now. All that being said, I guess I can at least try to show you and explain to you what I was going to do and then demonstrate by actually doing the project in another video here soon if you guys want to see it but essentially let me give you the rundown on what my strategy was going to be and there's a few different ways you could go about this because the main objective is to create sunlight but of course you can do it in a few different ways here's the main strip that i was going to plant with a food plot this strip going this way and then there's a trail you can see going that way and what I was gonna do is basically take a bunch of these trees on the left and right of the path and hinge cut them away from the path to create more straight and direct sunlight onto the path so that I can run through here with a bush hog and widen it out just a little bit because there's just a lot of real small brush on the sides of it and then plant a crop down here. Now, that's one way you could do it or what you could do is you could hire a logging company to come out here and you know say hey, you know, take every tree that's worth a penny off the side, the left or right of this long strip of, you know, trail here. And uh, you'd have to have enough for them to probably come out here to, for it to be worth their time. But, you know, like for example, there's some trees further down here, some hickories and stuff that they might want to come out here and take. They're not giant and they might not give you much of anything for them. Uh, but, you know, if, uh, if you can get anything from them and they come out and do the work for you essentially well, maybe you can't get out there and do it yourself or you just don't want to uh, you know that's another way you could do it because as long as you get the sunlight down on the path that's the that's the biggest objective here because you know it'll serve the same purpose really either way um, but that's essentially what we were going to do and then plant this it's probably you can't really see the whole distance it goes because it kind of winds back in there but probably about a hundred yard trail that's going to be planted in a food plot and we're going to put a couple different types of uh, food in here. We're going to do some clover. We're going to do some purple top turnips in the fall. But now for this portion over here, it's just so dense with brush and bushes. My idea was going to be to bring a tractor in here or something and just kind of use the bucket and push out some of these small saplings and uh, root them up and then uh, widen it out that way so you have enough sunlight to get down on the crops. Otherwise, nothing's going to grow if you don't have light. Sunlight is how things grow. You need sunlight and you need water and uh, nutrient-rich soil. If you don't have sunlight, none of the other things really do too much for you. So uh, that was the plan. And I've done something similar like this before and it's worked out good. So hopefully we can get out here soon and make this happen. Anyways, guys, hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you want to grab the 28 centuries, make sure you go to lmpgear.com, buy anything off the store and grab those 28 centuries. You can buy, you can buy a shirt, you can buy a coat, you can buy a hat like one of these um anything off the store anything you see on the store that you like you can buy and it gets you automatically entered to win and another thing to note is you do not need to have paypal or amazon pay to check out you can use paypal and just continue as guest and then pay with debit or credit card you don't need to have a paypal account a lot of people get confused when they see paypal at checkout they're like oh crap i don't have a paypal account or they think oh no i gotta make a paypal account you do not need to make a paypal account i think that's something that a lot of people get confused by uh, but just to be clear you do not need a paypal account to check out on our store if you want to see more of this stuff let me know if you don't also let me know anyways guys i'll catch you in the next video peace